Hi there. How you doing? Here we are on another beautiful Thursday afternoon, and I'm not even being facetious about that today. It is gorgeous out here in the uh, Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area here in Alameda, and um, pretty exciting, pretty exciting. Get out and get a, uh, move around for a few minutes. Really good day to do that. So today, I have a couple questions um, that were, have been sent in. One's on, and they're on two of my favorite topics. One I'll go into a bit more detail than the other, but um, two of my favorites. So one of them from a patient named Pat, it says, for years, a friend and I have had a disagreement about tea and water. That sounds like a fascinating <laughs> disagreement. She says drinking the tea is drinking tea is the same as drinking water. I disagree. I feel boiling the water and adding a tea bag transformed the water into something different from drinking spring or filtered water, which is what I drink. I have a Berkey filter. Well, first, congratulations on having a Berkey filter. Berkeys are the bomb. Um, and it actually almost hurts my heart a little bit when people talk about tea in what I see as a slightly disparaging way. Uh, it was my foray into tea drinking that I think had a huge element um, a huge part to play in my still being on the planet and alive at this point. My first acupuncturist, uh, this is in 1972, probably. Uh, I went to, I was supposed to have back surgery. I'd blown a couple discs and got a couple of opinions. And they said, yeah, surgery is the only way. I went to him and he kind of laughed about it. Um, told me to change the error of my ways, uh, give up some of my bad habits, uh, stop drinking coffee at that time. And uh, for, for very particular reasons, I'm not saying you should all give up coffee. I'm saying at that time, it was important for me and started me on the path of drinking green tea. That, and I started doing Tai Chi and Qigong. That combination, I'm quite clear, um, saved my life. And I went back to him a couple times for different issues. And that's what really inspired me to... Um, study traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And first, in fact, I first started studying with him back in the 70s. Uh, he was primarily an herbalist and a Taiji instructor, brilliant, brilliant Taiji instructor. Uh, at 83 years old, he was still doing high flying kicks and full out splits, etc. And so that's what got me started with my energy work. And then uh, also with my herbal and uh, food studies. So, Pat, uh, let me talk about this a little bit, because as I said, it, it is one of my favorite topics. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Now, when we talk about tea, many people uh, don't mean the same thing. Uh, we generally talk about tea drinking as drinking the uh, water that has been infused with the Camellia sinensis plant. In many countries, when they talk about tea drinking, they're mostly talking about doing infusions of uh, different herbal infusions, chamomile, mint, uh, varieties of mints, et cetera. And so I'm going to make that distinction. Uh, mostly when I'm talking about tea today, I'm talking about Camellia sinensis, uh, the amazing, amazing, miraculous plant. And uh, But we do use infusions. Uh, I do them with my, you know, myself. But we also have many of our patients doing infusions, our most popular. And so I don't mean infusion like you stick it in your arm. I mean, you just soak the tea bag in it so that it infuses uh, its ingredients into the hot water. And so our number one tea that we use for that is a tea called Cistus Incanus, uh, I-N-C-A-N-U-S. Uh, and we get ours uh, from it's very, very specifically grown. And it is the most astounding uh, infusion on the planet. It's our first line of treatment for things uh, things as various as viral illnesses, retroviral illnesses, fungal illnesses. Uh, it also has some antibacterial qualities. It was kind of a random discovery. Uh, someone noticed that this island who was famous for having really healthy goats had these beautiful trees that were all trimmed just exactly the same. 
and uh, looked really beautiful. And someone asked him, one of the people, you know, oh my gosh, you know, who trims your trees? And, you know, the guy laughed. He said, well, the goats do that. That's as far up as they can reach to eat the leaves of the of the tree. And um, it's kind of then people noticed that these were the healthiest goats in the area. And so they started to study Cistus and Canis and found these amazing, amazing qualities. So that's all I'm going to talk about infusions for today. I do want to talk about tea and the difference between tea drinking and plain water drinking. I think both are really, 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 really good for you. Uh, tea has gotten a bad rap in that for two reasons primarily. One, it tends to pull up a lot of minerals from the soil. Well, that's the good news too, but it will pull up um, fluoride, for example. So it's much better if you're getting tea that is uh, watered with unfluoridated water, right? Because it will pull up too much fluoride. Now, the amount of fluoride that it pulls up, I personally don't believe is tremendously damaging. I think the benefits far outweigh the uh, detriments in that case, but that is one of the issues. Um, and so uh, all of the things that we typically call tea, green tea, black tea, oolong tea, pu'er, et cetera, are all from the same plant. Uh, there are slight variations by region that it's grown, by the soil, by certain uh, subspecies, but it's all Camellia sinensis. And it's basically all the same tea. So green tea is tea that is picked and is steamed uh, almost immediately. And the steaming stops the process um, of the enzyme activity uh, that breaks down the tea. If you leave the enzyme activity to go for some period of time and then shut it off, you'll get an oolong or a brownish looking tea. And if you crumple it and allow the process um, to go on even further, the enzymes will turn the tea black and it'll have different qualities to it. Now, amongst the oolong teas, the most prized is pu'er, uh, P-U, generally. Now, these are these spellings can vary. P-U space E-R-H. Pu'er teas can go for thousands and thousands of dollars a pound, $15,000 a pound for some of the better pu'ers. Now, rarely is it purchased by the pound. It's usually uh, purchased by the ounce or in four-ounce patties. And the for most teas, green, black, oolong, uh, they do oxidize. And if they oxidize too much, they're exposed to the, to the elements, to the air, to light. Uh, then over time, they lose their potency. The exception is pu'er tea, which is very tightly packed. It is uh, it naturally, if it's really good stuff, inoculated with certain bacteria. If it's not naturally done, uh, it is artificially inoculated with particular bacteria, which causes a different enzymatic activity. And the pu'ers, um, there are people that search far and wide for it. At one time, it was stored in uh, bamboo. They'd hollow, hollow out the bamboo. Well, it's generally already hollowed out, but they would cut it and put the pu'er tea in it seal it very tightly and then bury it so that nobody would steal their precious pu'er stash. And pu'er uh, in the in Asian countries has often been sold much like fine wines, uh, bidding wars, et cetera. Now, each of those teas has a slightly different uh, benefit, but they are all extremely rich in antioxidants and other compounds that reduce inflammation in the body and uh, help any number of things. Um, and I have, <clears throat> excuse me, one database where I collect research studies uh, or articles and it's several thousand of them. And I have about three full pages on the benefits of green tea alone. Everything from curing mouth cancers, preventing mouth cancers, assisting in lowering all forms of cancer risk, I generally recommend it for people with eye problems. Green tea is particularly rich in a catechin called epigallocatechin gallate, 
or EGCG, and epigallocatechingallate um, has a very interesting property of attracting fluid to the vitreous humors in the eyes. So the jelly-like substance that's inside the eye, when that starts to dry out, uh, you form floaters or it pulls on the uh, retina. It can actually cause retinal detachment or retinal, retinal puckering. And so you wanna keep that fluid really, really uh, rich in moisture. And EGCG found in green tea uh, will maintain high levels of moisture for about 12 hours. So if you drink green tea twice a day, uh, it's one of the best things for eye health. Now, people know lutein, zeaxanthin, astaxanthin, et cetera, uh, are great. But any formula for eye health should have green tea or EGCG. Uh, in the journal Cancer a few years ago, uh, there was an article that delineated seven different natural herbal substances, or six of them were herbal, but seven natural substances that when they were tested in cancer clinics and in cancer studies, uh, dramatically, and I mean dramatically, reduced cancer metastasis, and EGCG was one of the primary uh, items in that study. So very powerful. Uh, when you get into the black teas, uh, the some of the antioxidant benefits are a little different. The caffeine levels tend to be a little different, um, but it's for many people much more of a taste delight. The the very very nuanced flavors when you get into the pu'er teas and the black teas, uh, the green teas also, uh, although those you know are more of an acquired taste. There are also white teas which are just very early green teas. They'll only pick off maybe two uh, buds off of each uh, tea uh, bush. So white tea is actually kind of the earliest. Now in Chinese medicine and in Chinese uh, dietetics, I'll, I'll call it, seasonal eating is the norm and the requirement for good health. Now, we tend not to do that in our culture because we have so many foods available so much of the time, but our bodies were actually not devised um, or created to eat all of those foods all of the time. You know, we could, you could never uh, live in Michigan and eat oranges in the middle of winter, and oranges aren't the best thing to eat in the middle of winter in cold climates. And so our body has adapted to a certain rhythm and flow to our food intake. And so when we're looking at the teas, I think they're a great example. Uh, green tea is the freshest, it's the, um, has mo the most vigorous growth properties in it. Uh, it's obviously green. And that's the color of the liver and gallbladder and the co color of springtime when things are growing. And so green tea is ideal uh, in the springtime. It's also so powerful in antioxidants and polyphenols that it will help restore your immune system after the cold winter, and it will be very beneficial at detoxifying your liver. Then when we get into the summer, we want the coolest tea that we can find, the least heating, and that would be the white teas. So you could go with a light green, or you could go into the white teas. Again, they're very cooling. As you get into the fall, I would switch to an oolong, which is slightly warming and is very rich, again, in polyphenols uh, and can help protect the lungs, the pu'er teas in particular. And then during the winter, when you need to keep the heat internal, you need more heat, you don't need to get rid of heat, you'd switch to a black tea. And if you look at, uh, say, in England, uh, where they are big tea drinkers. During the winter in particular, uh, they'll drink Earl Grey teas, which will have cardamom or some other um, heating uh, herb in it. And so those are herbs that bring the heat to the interior of the body, as opposed to things like chilies and peppers that make you perspire. And when you perspire, that is the body's uh, way of lowering the temperature. So you don't want those during the winter. What you want are the deep, deep, rich things like 
Oh, you could do a little cinnamon, but ginger, cardamom, etc. And so alternating through the year uh, to these different types of teas can have amazing beneficial effects. And, um, now, as I said, they're very high in antioxidants. And but the concern I mentioned that was the one I mentioned was the potentially high fluoride levels. The other one that I hear a lot is that they can be it can be very dehydrating. And so that would be a reason to drink water instead of tea. But I want to put that in a little bit of perspective here. And then also the, the caffeine levels. Now, one of the beautiful things about tea is that it does have caffeine, which is a very powerful neurostimulant. It will help you think more clearly. It reduces reaction time. It reduces uh, dementia risk, et cetera. And if you drink a lot of caffeine as with coffee, it can make you generally rather jittery. And that's because the caffeine isn't balanced with the chemical theanine, which uh, tea is. Tea has caffeine, but it also has theanine, which is one of the most relaxing substances. You'll see theanine in a lot of sleep products, and, but even more so in relaxation products. And so it's why you can uh, get your mind opened up and have a little brighter and quicker thinking, but not get jittery. So it's, if you're going to be taking an exam, tea is usually much better than coffee. So in terms of caffeine content, um, the, you know, like the green teas might have 16 to 20 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, per cup of tea. Um, if you get really, really strong with two grams of tea leaves, which is a fair amount, uh, you might get, oh, 35 to 40 milligrams of caffeine. And if you got the strongest tea that you can find and you uh, let, it, let it steep for a long period of time, five minutes or even a little bit more, you could get it up to 120 milligrams of caffeine. But to put in that pers in perspective, um, one cup of coffee, and by cup, I mean eight ounces, not a 16-ounce uh, Starbucks or Pete's coffee, uh, which also have higher caffeine levels anyway, but one cup of coffee will have up to 200 milligrams of caffeine. So about twice the uh, caffeine level that you're going to find in the tea. And if you're doing an energy drink, which I hope, I sincerely hope you don't get near uh, their energy drinks are deadly. There are many deaths a year from them. Um, and so energy drinks will give you about 160 milligrams. So even though it's lower than in caffeine, you could potentially have a little dehydration problem. But in studies, it's shown that um, in order to have a truly dehydrated, uh, a diuretic effect, meaning you pee a lot, uh, that's going to dehydrate you, that you need to consume about 500 milligrams, which is about oh, six to 13 cups of tea, depending on how you brew it. Um, so that's a lot of tea. Um, if, you, if you do moderate amounts, uh, it's as hydrating as water is. On my desk at work, I, I don't remember to drink. I'm always busy. And so on my desk, I have four, actually five, but four that I use regularly, cups on my desk. One of them has tea. One of them has a magnesium uh, and vitamin C drink and so on. And I won't leave work until I finish all of those. And I drink the tea partially because it's hydrating and partially because it's calming and partially because I get a little uh, lift in my mood from it. And so there were uh, there was a study they gave 50 heavy coffee drinkers um, either coffee or the same quantity of water for three consecutive days. So that was 26 and a half ounces of the caffeine, um, which had an, uh, about 80, well, it was equivalent of about 80 ounces of tea. Let's put it that way. And there was zero difference, zero difference in markers of hydration between the days when coffee was being um, the primary beverage and the days when water was the, the primary beverage. So it really, you have to drink massive amounts of tea and quite a bit of coffee before it is extremely dehydrating. And again, the last four studies that I saw on coffee uh, were that 
there was a significant increase in lifespan and a decrease in dementia risk. And those figures have been out there for tea for quite a while. Now, there was a poem that I used to quote, and I don't remember it exactly, but it really, really speaks to how I feel about drinking tea. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. The first cup moistens my throat. The second cup breaks my loneliness. The third cup, all the wrongs of life pass through my pores. I love that one because that's kind of what it feels to me. It's like, wake up in the morning. Okay, I'm thirsty. Oh, I don't really want to get up and, and go to work. Oh, okay. I'm feeling okay now. Oh, now I could never be upset with anybody. I feel great. I don't remember what the fourth cup does, but the fifth cup, I'm purified. The sixth cup calls me up to the realms of the immortals. And I got to tell you, although those sound kind of you know, overblown, that's kind of my experience. I, uh, a few years ago, was uh, writing a book with a doctoral classmate of mine uh, about fertility. And we'd finished for the day and we were walking back from where we were working on the book to her office where my car was. And we passed this building. It was an old, small Victorian. And she said, very uh, Yoda-like, you should go in there. And I said, okay, well, come on. She goes, oh, no, I don't have anywhere near enough time to go in there. And I thought, this is really weird. But I went in and I engaged the fellow that was in there who it was his tea shop. It was called Chaikana. And so, you know, I'd been a tea drinker from the early 70s, right? So uh, what's that? Almost it was 40 years I've been drinking tea. And, you know, I tend to dive into things and study them a bit. So I thought I knew something. Well, within 10 minutes, he totally disabused me of the notion that I knew anything. And he wasn't, he was very sweet about it. I mean, it wasn't like an ego thing. He was just a tea master. And he had studied with his teacher, who was a certified tea master, uh, and one of the world's experts on puer teas. And so he came and said, well, here, let's have a cup of tea. And uh, so I did, and it moistened my throat. And then we had another one. And gosh, there goes my loneliness. And now I'm in communication with this person. Uh, it's like deep communication. And then he said, you know, let's try some of the better stuff. Now, the stuff I was drinking was expensive by my standards, but then he pulled out his $500, a, uh, I don't remember what how many ounces it was, but it wasn't a lot, uh, tea. And so we drank that. And all the wrongs of my life passed through my pores. And by the next cup, I was purified. And he said, so what do you think? I said, this is amazing. So I was relaxed. I was in a complete meditative state. You know, the birds singing outside were like songs playing in a cathedral. It was amazing. And he said, well, let's try the really good stuff. So he made some of the really good stuff. And it was basically like I got called up to the realm of the immortals. It was astonishing. Um, I could see more clearly, I could think more clearly, I could hear more clearly, I was so deeply um, involved in communication with this person, it was truly astounding. So, as you can tell, I love my tea, and so I don't, it's not like I'm a tea lover, it's I love my tea. We have a little love affair going on, and I'm sure if there is reincarnation. Um, this has been true for me through many incarnations. So if you uh, want to check this out a little bit more, there's a, um, um, a, tea, a tea seller that puts out a magazine called The Global Tea Hut. It's tea and towel. Um, and check out the September 2020 edition, September 2020. And it's entitled Classics of Tea, the sequel to the Tea Sutra. Uh, or another place you can go is a place called, I don't know how you pronounce this, uh, but T-E-A-R-R-O-I-R. Terroir, T-E-A-R-R-O-I-R. Or 
check out Chaikana, C-H-A-I-K-A-N-A in Santa Cruz or locally. I don't know if, if they're both still open since the pandemic or not, but Imperial Tea Court in San Francisco or in Berkeley. Uh, in Berkeley, it's there on uh, Shattuck where all the fine restaurants are, kind of up and back uh, of some of them. And they will lay out a complete tea service for you and let you sample uh, any number of really, really wonderful teas. The owners are fabulous. So, um, Pat, enjoy your tea. <laughs> and drink a little water, too. It's good. And I love that you have a Berkey, which, of course, you'd have a Berkey, right? Um, okay. I'm just going to touch briefly on... A, another question, and the reason I'm going to touch on it briefly is because I have done and could do many hour shows on this topic. I teach this and it takes me days to go through, um, but I'm just going to say a couple things and then I'll probably say a little more next week. And one of the things, so I'll read the question, it says, I've been reading from the book, The Thyroid Debacle, that cellular stress is the initiator of cellular thyroid allostasis, cellular hypothyroidism. Okay, so don't tune out yet. I'm gonna break this down a little bit. Cellular hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Also, that what triggers cellular hypothyroidism is the lack of thyroid hormone in the body as a result of loss of thyroid gland function reduced amounts of thyroid hormone entering the cells and the cells actively deactivating thyroid hormones before they can bind to receptors. Can cellular hypothyroidism be addressed with acupuncture, herbs, and lifestyle? So I'll start with the last part first. Yes, uh, acupuncture can be very effective for hypothyroidism, although I will generally do some supplements and herbs to speed up the process. It takes a few treatments for most people. There are other hands-on techniques. Uh, red light therapy can be extremely effective. We have something that we import from England called circulation cream that we have people massage into the throat uh, near the thyroid, not right on the thyroid, but near it to help circulation. And uh, there are people that have been using this for years that say you can basically clear and cure all hypothyroid if you'll do this consistently for several weeks. And I'm not gonna go into the whole treatment protocol now. So yeah, there's one that you could do at home with red light, which is very inexpensive. You can get one for less than 50 bucks. That's the right frequency for this. Um, use a thyroid cream. And then there are a variety of supplements that you could take depending on the type of uh, the specific type of thyroid disorder you have. Uh, the most common things that we see are selenium, iodine, and tyrosine. Tyrosine binds the iodine. So uh, thyroid hormone T4 is four thyroid atoms tied together by tyrosine. That's the less active form of thyroid that's released. 90% of the thyroid hormone that's released into the system is T4, again named because of the number of uh, iodine uh, atoms that are in this um, molecule. When you need the active iodine molecule or the active thyroid molecule, one of those iodines breaks off and it becomes T3, right? Makes perfect sense. And Thai T3 is the energizer bunny. That's what gives you uh, the energy to live your life. Every cell in your body needs iodine and every cell in your body needs thyroid hormone to function. That's not quite true. There are a couple of cells that are not involved in this, but let's say 99% of your cells need those things to function properly. We are a very, very iodine deficient country. Uh, iodine deficiency um, leading to thyroid deficiency clearly shows up as a risk factor for all forms of glandular illnesses and cancers. Uh, in Japan, where they get up to 100 times more iodine, 
in their diets than we do. And almost everyone gets it 10 times more than we do on average. Uh, breast problems are a fraction what they are in the United States. That includes breast lumps, breast swelling, uh, breast cancers, et cetera. The other glandular problems are lessened also, ovarian problems, uh, prostate problems. And so the glands of the body need the highest amount of iodine. Uh, now, some of the glands are tiny, so they don't need a lot, right? But your pituitary needs a, needs the, gets the first hit of iodine, but it's tiny, it doesn't need a lot. Then the thyroid gland needs quite a bit because it's making your thyroid hormone. Now, most people in our culture don't have enough iodine to even fuel proper thyroid hormone production. But then they don't certainly don't have enough to protect the breast tissue, the ovarian tissue, and the prostate tissues, which are all glandular tissues that need even more iodine. So this is a significant problem. Um, sometimes just doing iodine, selenium, tyrosine, some combination, um, depend, again, depending on what your pr precise problem is, can um, restore proper thyroid health. Often it won't because we have so many insults that we have done to the thyroid gland. For example, um, the number one cause of inability to lose weight in middle age, particularly in women, but in men too, is stress. When you're under stress, one of the hormones that gets released is cortisol. Cortisol binds with leptin. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, with leptin, the hormone that tells your body it's safe to burn fat, so you won't burn fat. Because under stress, the body thinks there's an emergency. It may be a famine and we need to keep our fat stores at all costs. It'll burn muscle, that's okay, but don't burn the fat because that's what we're gonna need to survive on. So you won't burn fat and high cortisol binds to T4 and prevents the conversion to T3. So you can have enough thyroid hormone being released, but you're not getting the conversion so you're not getting the active form of thyroid. Also, when you have high cortisol, you're going to generally have higher levels of inflammation and the cytokines, the chemical messengers, can block the thyroid receptor sites so that uh, even if you have enough T4 and you have enough T3, you still, your body won't use it because, and that's why the testing you have to be very careful with. You can have perfect TSH, you can have perfect T4 and perfect T3 and still be functionally hypothyroid. That's why you've got to go to even deeper levels of examination to see exactly what the problems are. Now, the question here, one of the, one of the questions was um, cellular hypothyroidism. Yes, um, you measure it in the serum, right? Because you can't, it's very hard to measure cellularly. Uh, but the problem is, this, I mean, the, the serum is going to carry the thyroid hormone to the cells. And so this is a cellular hypothyroid problem. And so then the thyroid hormone doesn't enter the cells because the receptors are blocking it. And, uh, as I, and the cells actively deactivating the thyroid hormone. I just mentioned a couple ways that that happens, but there are more. So acupuncture can treat that, one, by reducing stress, and two, by activating blood flow to the thyroid gland, which is gonna help. Herbs is, are the primary way that I treat uh, thyroid disorders, herbs and supplements. And then lifestyle is the most important thing. A diet is critical, absolutely critical. The number one, no, nothing else is even close. The number one trigger for elevated thyroid peroxidase antibodies. So that's TPO antibodies, which is usually the first uh, sign of Hashimoto's or autoimmune thyroiditis. The number one trigger by far, and I've tested this on patients, is wheat, okay? Nothing else even close. Um, I'm, you know, and there are whole, we could spend an hour going into why that occurs, but it's a very real thing. And I, you know, Sorry, you know, bat to bash your old wheat, but it really deserves a bit of bashing. So mm -hmm. at any rate, uh, that's about all I'm going to say about thyroid right now. Um, your 
99% of the MDs that you go to will not truly understand thyroid disorders on a level that you probably need them to be understood. So you can do some research on your own, or you can find someone that actually does look a lot deeper into the problems uh, because thyroid disorders are running rampant in our country. I'm sitting here in my recliner at home. Usually I'm working on a Thursdays, but today we switched a couple days, so I'm home. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, can you say the name of the tea magazine again? Sure. Global Tea Hut. <clears throat> and it's subtitled Tea and Dao, spelled T-A-O. And the one that had a whole list of articles, it's more kind of poetic in a way, uh, and any of their editions are fine. They go through great detail about tea brewing and tea types, et cetera. Uh, the one that I looked at was September 2020. Okay. And then um, could you address what to do for macular degeneration? I've tried lutein, zeaxanthin, yeah, right. Right. and bilberry and fish oil with no improvement in vision. Yeah. Uh, there's a ton that can be done. Um, acupuncture is actually quite valuable for that also. Uh, you know, you're looking at lutein, zeaxanthin, astaxanthin, all those ins um, are all beneficial at uh, really increasing uh, antioxidant activity in the eye. Uh, some of them increase blood flow, certainly would add green tea or green tea extract or EGCG to that. Also, luteolin. Luteolin is kind of a latecomer on the block in terms of looking at these compounds that are so beneficial to the eyes, but luteolin is extremely valuable. I would recommend looking into uh, light therapy. There are certain frequencies, and I'm not going to go into the exact frequencies here because you really need to do a little more study or see someone who does that, um, but red light. Uh, shined around the eye in particular ways, particular patterns can be very effective at uh, helping that. The, one of the big problems, when we look at macular problems, uh, what's happening generally, now there are a few different potential processes, but generally it's a matter of blood flow problems. And so you can do everything else right, but if you have sticky blood, what Chinese medicine calls blood stasis, you're not going to deliver those nutrients to the eye. It doesn't matter how many, you know, tons of nutrients you have in your bloodstream. If your blood is static and um, it can't get through those small vessels leading up to the retina, it's not going to help at all. Uh, you've got to make sure that the blood flow is maximized, absolutely maximized. For that, I prefer. My number one choice is PEMF mats, pulsed electromagnetic frequencies, which help the blood to decoagulate and so they can flow better. I also would use some, some of the proteolytic enzymes, and it depends on what else is going on, which ones I would use. Uh, but natokinase is extremely safe and uh, would certainly help. Serapeptase is very safe, and I would certainly think about that. Lumbrokinase is a little bit stronger, not a little, it's a lot stronger, uh, but still safe enough that I would consider that. So you really need to look at blood flow. And the first place to look at blood flow issues for this, this type of blood flow issue are the sublingual veins underneath the tongue. So get a flashlight, stand in front of the mirror, stick out your tongue and then lift your tongue up so that you can see the bottom of the tongue. And if those sublingual veins, now ideally you won't see anything, literally, and people are stunned uh, after a while when those sublingual veins kind of disappear. Um, but the sublingual veins, um, if they're enlarged, if they're purplish blue, et cetera, then your blood's not moving. It's hypercoagulable there. So it's not delivering nutrients. See, this is what's important. Um, you, there are photomicrographs that you can find online of blood in people that have been around high levels of electromagnetic, well, high levels, the levels most of us are at, 
which are high, of electromagnetic frequencies, and the blood in the vessels looks like rush hour on the LA freeway. It is barely, barely moving. And when you get to the little off ramps where it's going into the smaller vessels, it looks like a six car pileup. Literally, you'll see five or six red blood cells blocking the exit uh, so that other red blood cells can't get into the blood vessels. If they can't get into the blood vessels, they cannot deliver oxygen and they cannot deliver nutrients. And equally as important, they can't take away the waste products. Now, most people diagnosed with dry macular degeneration are first diagnosed with drusen, D-R-U-Z-E-N. And drusen is uh, a deposit on the surface of the retina, but it's really waste products that are not being removed by those blood vessels behind the retina. Those blood vessels are tiny, tiny, by the way. And so the waste products just get dumped onto the surface of the retina and they're not getting oxygenated and they're not getting nutrients. So guess what? They're going to suffer. The cells are going to die. The retina is going to become damaged and eventually you lose vision or at least partially uh, lose vision. So do all those nutrients. Those are all great. And then your blood, make sure your blood is moving. Is that okay? okay? Yeah. And another question might might actually be you already answered it. I was diagnosed with glaucoma and cataracts. Can you speak to that and how to treat? Or can glaucoma be reversed? Yeah, glaucoma can be reversed, which I wouldn't have. There are two different drugs that can control uh, glaucoma. Uh, there's now narrow angle and wide angle. If it's narrow angle, they'll probably want to do surgery because the pressure. So glaucoma is a buildup of pressure in the eyeball. And eventually that pressure can cause pressure, uh, too much pressure against the retina and it will damage the retina and you, you can cause blindness. In fact, it's a, it has historically been a major cause of blindness. The drugs are very, you know, pretty good. They work most of the time without a lot of side effects. But I've had cases, and so I, 10 years ago, uh, I probably would have said, yeah, just, just do the drugs. Um, and they're, they're drops in the eyes. <clears throat> but I had one fella come in, and uh, he was from uh, a veteran, and VA sent him over. And I was kind of surprised that they let me treat him for glaucoma, because that's not a known, uh, ac acupuncture is not a known treatment with them for glaucoma. But his doctor said, yeah, great, go for it. So I treated him. He got another test. No decent results had gone, his pressure had gone down just a touch. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna, not, I'm gonna stop doing that traditional treatment and I'm gonna do another treatment. And uh, I did it based on the names of the points primarily. And I gave it a completely different set of points. Well, after six weeks, I get a call from a doctor at VA. And he said, what the hell are you doing to my patient? And I, and I gulped a couple times. I said, oh, 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 what do you mean? He goes, and he named the patient. And he said, don't do any more work. His blood, his uh, eye pressures are getting too low. We're going to take him off medication. And I was totally blown away. And they then started a study through VA of treating glaucoma with acupuncture. I've also had it work with other people. So I know it can work. I would not never say that it's 100%, but I have seen cases where it has worked. Primarily, I would use supplements. So yes, that is treatable. Mm -hmm. uh, cataracts, it's really, it's kind of like, if you look at a uh, headlights on an old car, mm -hmm. you'll see they're, they're uh, hard to see through, right? They're oxidized. And that's what happens with the cataracts. Primarily through exposure to sun, uh, they get oxidized and they get cloudy. And when they get cloudy, that's the lens. So it's very difficult to see through. So the key is how to make it less cloudy. The single best thing that I've found is eye drops of L-carnosine, um, not carnitine, but l Dash C A R N O S I N E. There's one brand called Can C C A N dash C. Uh, 
uh, that used to be available through Life Extension Institute. I assume it's still available. And for mild to moderate cataracts, um, I've seen them completely resolve. Severe cataracts, probably going to retire, uh, require surgery. So yeah, both of those can be treated uh, with a variety of methodologies. All right? Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you for joining me. I love doing this. And I will be back next Thursday. Okay. So, huh? Can we talk about Gabby? Oh, yeah. Just a reminder. Um, we now have a new acupuncturist, a delightful woman um, that does some slightly different specialties. She's very good at treating jaw disorders, TMJ, uh, also does facial acupuncture uh, and, and does sports medicine. As you know, uh, Jenny, my wife, isn't always available because she's off running around the country with sports teams. Um, but we now have two other people that have done significant studies with Jenny and with Jenny's mentor doing sports medicine and orthopedic acupuncture. Uh, and they're very, very good. Uh, the great thing for me is Gabby, this young woman's name, is available on Sundays. So that's been a big hole in our schedule. So now we can get people in on Sundays. So thanks, Catherine. Um, so thank you all. I'll be back next Thursday. Same bat time, same bat channel. Bye-bye.